Good morning, everyone. Let me first of all thank Carimed and the sponsors for inviting the Ministry of Health to present here today and uh, to share with us some of the roles and functions that we carry out within the division and also to let us know as we're looking at regulating supplements for a healthy nation that regulation is the business of all of us. Just want to say to us this morning that when we contemplate supplements for a healthy nation and we listen to the presentation of Prof. Tolery just now, I am thinking it probably was divine intervention for me to start with this slide. The best prescription for disease prevention is healthy lifestyle. I thought I would start with that slide. Why? Because from my experience being in the Ministry of Health for quite a while now, I've noticed that there has been an increase in flux in the dietary supplements in terms of products submitted for registration or assessment and being used by our population. I don't have the specific statistics to share with us today, but the international statistics is showing that global business in dietary supplements is more than 1 million, sorry, 100 billion US dollars annually. So it's a big business. And uh, research has shown and uh, was, was actually borne out with Prof. Tolery's presentation that lifestyle is really the best prescription for disease prevention, healthy lifestyle that is. And uh, when we contemplate the various studies that have been done, research has shown that when we actually look about the business of doing healthy lifestyle practices, actually when we, when we ingest proper diet, we find that there is little or no need for the use of supplements. But when we think about that, we also need to bear in mind we also need to bear in mind the fact that there are individual choices. Persons must have their own their individual choices, and that's one of the responsibility of any state. They are responsible for protecting our health, and that's the public health, public health, and they are also responsible for maintaining the integrity of individual choices. And so, in doing the presentation this morning, I just wanted to share with us what I'm expecting to accomplish through this presentation. And that is to basically to provide an overview of the Ministry's position on the regulation of supplements in Jamaica, to update all of us here this morning regarding the status of the regulatory framework governing supplements locally, and uh, to briefly indicate challenges faced in regulating the supplement industry. The WHO, from their perspective, have indicated that health is a human right. And when we're talking about health here, we're talking about the, not just the absence of disease, but we're talking about a state of physical, mental, social, and spiritual well-being. And uh, access to essential drugs constitute part of the human right to health. And I would want to advance that access to essential products constitute part of the human right to health. And as I mentioned earlier, um, the role of the government in terms of its state responsibility is that of protecting public health and uh, the integrity of individual choices. Protecting the public health, identifying the risk, mitigating the risk, while at the same time allowing for individuals to have that choice. And I just want to think about the great creator himself who gave all of us choices. And so it would not be the role of the government to take away our choices as it relates to what we use to maintain health. So we're talking this morning about regulation. And uh, 
As we contemplate reg regulation, and this is a paraphrased approach to the WHO's definition, it's a mutual reinforcement of numerous activities, all directed at promoting and protecting health. And uh, these activities could include products, as we're talking about products this morning, product assessment, it includes product registration, it includes inspections, it includes post-marketing surveillance, it includes pharmacovigilance, as was mentioned earlier. And uh, the activities vary from country to country in scope and implementation, but usually includes common functions. And as we contemplate this, the activities um, differing in, in scope in various countries, we will look at it as we look at what happens on the international scene regarding the regulation of supplements. In regulating, we regulate who, what, and where. We regulate providers of services, and in this case, we are talking about our health practitioners. We regulate manufacturers and suppliers of healthcare products. And uh, we don't necessarily regulate consumers, but we have a responsibility to educate consumers. Why? The scientific information that is known to the manufacturers, the scientific information that is known to the healthcare providers is not known necessarily to our consumers. We know that information is more readily available now and quite a bit of our consumers are reading much more and know much more than some of us know. But for most, on the most part, we find that persons are not necessarily able to understand some of that information. And so it becomes our responsibility to explain to them and to make them more aware as it relates to how they make their choices and why they should or should not choose a particular product. We regulate the products. We regulate drugs, food, supplements, herbal preparations. We regulate devices. We regulate biological products. We regulate other products as it relates to the delivery of services. And as I contemplate the supplements that is indicated there in products, we will be looking a little bit at the definition of supplements and we will understand therefore why we had separated herbal preparations from supplements. And we regulate the facilities we regulate based on a good manufacturing practice standards, good distribution practice standards, good laboratory practice standards as it relates to the production of the products and services. We regulate ports of entry. Why? Because apart from our, um, what I would want to call clients in terms of the industry, we have individuals who go and procure products in other jurisdictions and uh, bring them in, sometimes for personal use, sometimes to do business. And these individuals are not aware of the issues relating to the use and distribution of these products. And so we intercept some of these products at the ports of entry, where action is taken either to restrict the import of same or to educate in the use of same. And so what we find is that in regulating, we try as much as possible to capture the entire picture to safeguard the public health. Regulation, and we all know what the laws entails, set standards. Standards as it relates to the product quality, standards as it relates to the manufacturing practices, standards as it relates to the practice that persons are supposed to be carrying out in relation to their ethical guidelines, etc. We regulate, regulation protects people. And we mentioned earlier how it is so. Some persons choose to use products not necessarily very knowledgeable as to the benefits, not necessarily very knowledgeable as to the effect, the side effects of these products. And so under the circumstances, the regulator's responsibility to, is, is to ensure that these individuals make informed choices. We uh, regulations provide redress. And we know about the various cases in court, yes? We know about situations where persons, after products were marketed, were harmed from the use of the products. And we know that the law supports their being able to have redress 
based on what was provided to them as it relates to the manufacturer's information. And we know that the regulatory system is not perfect because sometimes it's only after the product comes to the market that some issues are discovered. But nonetheless, we have in place a system of pharmacovigilance which helps us to be able to mitigate the risk to individuals from any adverse, unknown adverse events that may, may, may surface when the product comes to market. Regulation ensures supply of products and ingredients from reputable sources, and it ensures practitioners take responsible, informed approach regarding safety. And how? Because regulations in terms of the enforcement has certain um, what you'd call sanctions that are associated with same. And once the sanctions are substantive, sub substantive enough, what we find is persons refuse to go, uh, go uh, outside of their regulated standards and so we are able to ensure that we have safe products on our market. This slide basically is to show us or give us an idea of what is happening in certain jurisdictions as it relates to the regulation of supplements. Um, the areas in green are those jurisdictions in which no, no notification for marketing um, approval is required or no registration is required. In the jurisdictions in yellow, registration for marketing approval is required, but this kind of regulatory approach is of low or medium complexity. And in red, we find that the registration for marketing approval is required and uh, the complexity for approval of these products is medium or high. And uh, when we look at what is happening across the globe, we realize that uh, regulation of supplements in terms of its, its use is now growing in leaps and bounds. Why? Because there are certain risks that are being identified from the use of these products, and we're gonna talk a little bit about those risks as we progress. We mentioned earlier that we would speak a little bit about what happens in the international jurisdictions. In the United States, dietary supplements are regulated as foods. And uh, this is regulated within the meaning of the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act. Now persons will know that FDA is the drug regulatory authority in the United States. So why am I not saying that the FDA is regulating stringently supplements in the United States. The FDA, in times past, regulated dietary supplements under the heading of food additives, where they would either indicate that the product has grass status or no grass status, generally recognized as being safe. What happened is that with, and I would want to say, the influence of money, can I use that, can I use that term? the action was passed to prevent the FDA from regulating food ingredients in that, in that way, that dietary supplements in that way. And so that is how the Dietary Supplements Health and Education Act came into being. And this act gave a specific definition for dietary supplements and forced the FDA from regulating products prior to reaching the market and asked that the FDA be given the responsibility of proving that a product is unsafe after the product gets to the market. And so if we look at bullet number four, it says that prior to the act, the FDA static was to declare dubious supplements as unapproved food additives. And then after the act was passed, they forced an FDA to enforce jurisdiction, no jurisdiction on the products unless they can prove that the supplement was unsafe. And it had to be significant or unreasonable risk of injury that they would use to prove that. And of course we know that it's difficult in times because what we find is that the complaints will come in. It may come in from individual. It may be a scenario in which we have a difficulty in getting the evidence based on the fact that herbs and other supplements based on their components are difficult to do research on. And I can think of a particular herb right now that is very topical, and I call it herb, but I'm sure I am putting that in quotation mark. 
and uh, that, it, that, that is the use of our cannabis products. And we recognize that there are a lot of issues as it relates to the kind of research that needs to be done in the use of that plant. And so what we find is that it is difficult at times to be able to prove um, significant or unreasonable risk of injury. And so and we will find that as time goes on, we need to improve on our pharmacovigilance because it is only the true pharmacovigilance and that is also not only monitoring drugs, monitoring supplements as well, that we'll be able to do some serious detection and to be able to take some action as it relates to the products on our market. What about Canada? Now Canada regulates um, their, what, what, they, what they classify as natural health products through the natural and non-prescription health products directorate. And every product and manufacturer of dietary supplements or natural health products must be licensed. And uh, unless the only, the only exemption from not being licensed is if the product is being compounded by healthcare practitioners. And so there's stringent regulation of natural health products in Canada. What about Europe? Food supplements are regulated as food in that jurisdiction. And uh, the legislation focuses mainly on vitamins and minerals that are used in food supplements. And these usually they refer to as additives. And uh, they also have enforced a very important aspect as it relates to standards, and that is minimum and maximum levels for vitamins and minerals. Now, the, the e European Commission is that entity to which companies need to apply if they need to put new drugs, new supplements on the market. And those will be supplements that would not have been known and listed prior to their um, ascension to market. We thought we would share with you what happens in Australia. And in Australia, the dietary supplements, most of them are regulated under a category called complementary medicine. And it includes vitamins and your minerals, it includes also homeopathic products. In some jurisdictions, including Jamaica to some extent, homeopathic products of a particular concentration are not necessarily regulated prior to going on the market. And in Australia, complementary medicines may either be listed as registered or registered, depending on their ingredients and claims. And we will talk a little bit about claims in a little while. In China, and we know that for ages, China is the biggest industry as it relates to supplements. And uh, in 2015, they enacted the new Chinese food safety law. And in that law, it included 13 items related to health food regulations. And subsequent to that, the China Food and Drug Administra Administration implemented regulatory system changes so that they now look closely at the products that are manufactured on their market and sold on their market. So we're talking about supplements. What definition are we looking at? The United States defined a supplement as, and we are using again the DSHEA Act definition. It speaks about a product other than tobacco that is intended to supplement diet that contains one or more dietary ingredients or their constituents, is intended to be taken by mouth as a pill, capsule, tablet, or liquid, and is labeled on the front panel as being a dietary supplement. And that last bullet is important in the United, in the United States as it relates to products. And uh, one other critical thing about the label in the United States is that a statement need to go on all their supplement products to indicate that any statement of claim made was not assessed by the US FDA. Now, the European Union definition, and this, this, this basically is a working definition that they use, is as an addition to normal diet, the business operators can market food supplements which are concentrated sources of nutrients with a nutritional or physiological effect. And of course, they have put the dosage form that these products can be marketed in. And uh, what we mentioned earlier about the fact that the EU has 
put in place minimum and maximum levels as it relates to these nutrients are very important when we look at the products that come on our market from the EU. I mentioned earlier about the size of the industry. And uh, the evidence, the statistics is showing that in 2015, the global market was estimated to be US 109 billion and is estimated to grow to 180 billion by 2020. Another projection indicated that by 2024, it should be at 278 billion. So it's a big money business. And I just want to mention that we are recognizing the diversity in terms of how products are coming to market. So the range and composition of the supplements are almost endless. We're looking at the common multivitamins targeting age, gender, physical conditions, activity level. So one product can be coming to the market with the same strength, same dosage form, but indicated for different conditions. And of course, persons will buy the two different products not understanding that they could use one product for more than one indication. What are some of the driving force behind this increase in the use of dietary supplements or the size of the industry? We recognize that persons are very conscious about wellness and fitness and enhanced quality of life now. And persons are living longer and hence we see a lot of interest in the supplement market. We are seeing increased use of natural substance while rejecting so-called chemicals. And of course, persons are complaining about the side effects of drugs. And they are complaining about the fact that the drug industry or the manufacturers of pharmaceuticals are ignoring natural products because their use could not be protected by patents. And so they are not necessarily producing supplements they'd rather produce these, what they call toxic chemicals. And uh, of course, we recognize that there is an increase in the number of diseases and the types of diseases, and so persons are looking for anything that will cure. When I contemplate, when I started working at the Ministry of Health, what would be presented to us would have been, for example, preparations in tablet form, capsule forms, or liquid forms. Now, we are seeing preparations in various other form, um, dosage form. So we are seeing, for example, a scenario where we are having sustained release products. We are seeing scenarios in which persons are using gel, gummies, you know, all these things that will be attractive to children. And so we are seeing quite a bit of novel preparations coming on the market. We are seeing combinations of all different kinds. And so with all of this, we find that the size of the market is increasing. There is a notion that natural is synonymous with safe. Yeah? It's free from adverse and harmful effects. And that's something that we need to dispel as it relates to our clients. Because we know the science behind all of this. We are recognizing that marketing of dietary supplements has expanded. And so they are being promoted or advertised as being beneficial for health, for disease prevention, to even enhancement of mental and physical performance. And so with all this mod modality of advertisement, we find that persons gravitate towards the procurement of these items. And the last time I checked, they were not cheap. Sufficient evidence exists now, now over the years, um, some evidence has been amassed and sufficient evidence exists for benefits in some cases. And over the years, we know that dietary supplements that are used for the management of nutritional deficiencies have been very successful in saving lives and, turn and improve, improving the quality of lives of individuals. But in some cases, it has been shown that there is no significant value over a carefully planned and balanced diet. And uh, one of the other reasons why we are seeing this increase in the industry or the growth in the size of the industry is because we now have some basic regulations established to govern the industry. Coming out of, to some extent, complaints from the clients, as well as some amount of uh, monitoring and evaluation, post-marketing surveillances, what has been discovered 
is that there has been increases in complications, and uh, this is usually uh, associated with an increase in the dose of the product that is used. And uh, when we look at, for example, complications as it relates to, for example, liver diseases, kidney diseases, we find that there are certain kinds of supplements that are implicated for same. And I just mentioned some here. Commonly implicated agents include your anabolic steroid, which are used by bodybuilders, your green tea extract, and usually these are for weight loss, and multi-ingredient nutritional supplements. Power WHO has indicated that there is not any benefits to be had over taking multivitamins versus taking individual vitamins in the number and the concentration that is required. Now, because of the safety concern, we want to indicate that this demands a public health approach to their regulations. And so it is very important for us as we contemplate the regulation of these products that the Ministry of Health has taken the right direction, has gone in the right direction to regulate these products prior to market as opposed to after marketing as is indicated in some jurisdiction. On the slide, you're looking at a, a drug by the name of Lipitor and uh, we all know that drugs are regulated as drugs. And when we think about the regulation of drugs, we're, um, we're looking at the pre-marketing approval that must prove efficacy and safety prior to coming to market. We are also looking at the regulation of drugs post-marketing to discover adverse events and to take whatever action is necessary for the drug to stay or be removed from the market. And this drug is indicated for the treatment of persons with high cholesterol, right? But we are looking on the slide now at another product. And this product is called Cardio Edge. And uh, it, is, it contains citrus-based extracts along with pomegranate extracts. And uh, it is considered a dietary supplement. But how should we regulate such a product? Should it be regulated as a food, or should it be regulated as a dietary supplement, or should it be regulated as a drug? This will depend on whether or not the product claim is synonymous with that, that is associated with the definition of a drug. It is also related to the ingredient that is contained in the product, and it is also related to the dose of the ingredient in the product the regulation of a pharmaceutical versus that of a dietary supplement. When we contemplate the moiety of most pharmaceuticals, we realize that they are chemicals and can be natural or synthetically derived. Dietary supplements mostly are derived from food, plant, or animal tissues. Pharmaceuticals are regulated as drugs, Dietary supplements are regulated in most jurisdictions as foods or nutritional products. We mentioned earlier that pharmaceuticals require regulatory pre-marketing assessment of risk and efficacy. For dietary supplements, in most jurisdictions, pre-marketing assessment of risk is limited. Post-marketing surveillance for adverse reactions, we have spoken and we have heard a lot about that from morning. In the case of dietary supplements, this is limited or non-existent. When we look at the system we mentioned earlier, it's not perfect on either side, neither for drugs nor for dietary supplements, based on the fact that we find that after some products come to market, we identify some risk. However, when we look at dietary supplements, some risk with these type of products differ from pharmaceuticals. And this could be associated with the source, because for example, if we're looking at a source of a dietary supplement as being a herbal product, then we could look at contamination with aflatoxins and other kinds of um, what we would call heavy metals and so on. So under the circumstances, there are additional risk, and we will talk a little bit about those risks as well. In Jamaica, we operate on the, the Food and Drug Act and Regulations and the Pharmacy Act and Regulations with regards to the regulation of the products that the Ministry of Health has jurisdiction over. And uh, 
The law defines food and it defines drug and therefore outlines the scope for us to operate under. And when we look at the definition of a drug, and all of us here knows this definition, it's any substance or mixture of substance manufactured, sold, or represented for use in diagnosis, treatment, mitigation, or prevention of a disease, disorder, abnormal physical state, or symptoms thereof in man or animal, or for restoring, correcting, or modifying organic functions in man or animal. I mentioned earlier that if a dietary supplement makes a claim or as an indication that is speaking similarly to what is indicated here for the definition of a drug, it means therefore that we are going to be regulating that quote-unquote supplement under the category of drugs in Jamaica. And I said earlier, as it relates to the scope of our regulations, that the law dictates. And you notice I didn't have a definition there for dietary supplement. And the definition for dietary supplement is not there. However, when I get closer to the end of the, the um, presentation, we, I will share with you some history as it relates to how we regulate. And I will also share with us some history or, or some, 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 some future activities that are taking place. And so at the end of the presentation, we will see a little bit more as to what it is that we are doing right now in Jamaica to update our laws, which are, as we recognize from 1966 and 1964, um, in terms of the, <laughs> in, in, ter in terms of how old our laws are, and so some amendments need to be made to them. So, but then why do we regulate dietary supplements in Jamaica? We regulate based on the fact that we need to maintain the product integrity that are on the, of the products that come to our market. We need to regulate or protect the customer's interests. We need to maintain requisite standards and we need to ensure public safety is not compromised. So under the caption of product integrity, we assess the product based on the quality. And uh, the areas that we look at in terms of assessing the product based on quality is the conformity assessment for proper identity. And so when a manufacturer develops a product, they need to be able to carry out certain tests to be able to show to the regulator that what they indicated is in the product is what is there. And so they provide us with the tests that will be used to identify the ingredients that are indicated or stated to be in the product then uh, they need to also provide us with information as it relates to impurities and contaminants. And uh, impurities and contaminants, as listed there, could be your heavy metals or aflatoxins and so on. But what is important is that there are established standards of levels above which these kind of contaminants should not be in the product. And in, in some cases, it is such that there should be none of these products present in the product, none of these contaminants pre pre present in the product. Then we also look at the source of the raw material and the processing of the raw material. We also look at good manufacturing practice standards and we look at product stability. And the client needs to provide us with information as it relates to how it is that the shelf life of the product was established. What are some of the common pro problems that we have noted in our, in our scope of regulation? We find that there are misrepresentation of product contents that are presented to the ministry. Different recommended doses are seen among products presented to the ministry. Inadequate information about how a com company's herbs are grown and processed. And poor standard of quality, product safety, or activity as it relates to the ingredients. And so, not only is the Ministry of Health looking at putting in place good manufacturing practice standards to govern the industry, but this is something that is happening internationally and is being advocated for. So moving forward, we will realize that the Ministry of Health does not take a decision regarding the regulation of product on our own, but we use reference countries such as the US and Canada for our decisions that we make regarding the products that we regulate. Now, we mentioned earlier about good manufacturing practice standards. And for drugs, we know they are well established and they utilize 
the, ph the pharmaceutical good manufacturing practice standards as a guideline, and the main focus is on consistency, potency, and purity, while the regulation of food utilizes the food GMP, and the main focus is on the reduction of contaminants, adulterants, and filth. So at the end of the day, what we recognize is that there is no emphasis on potency and no, no emphasis on consistency as it relates to manufacturing standards. And so what we are basically saying is that the manufacturing standards for supplements should include product specifications. They need to provide information on the premises, the equipment that are used, the operations that are carried out. Quality assurance is important as it relates to the, the products that they pr produce and market. And uh, they need to be able to do batch recall. Efficacy is the other integrity that we look at. And of course, it speaks to the product claim. Is the product able to make the indication as is stated on the label? We look at the pharmacological activity of the ingredient. The potency, is, the do is it an effective dose? We look at the rationale for the combination. Is it an additive effect? Is it a potentiating effect? Is it a nulling effect? We look at all of these when we are assessing the products. And we look at the nature of the claim to ensure that same is justified. And uh, depending on what is presented as a claim, a dietary supplement can be, in Jamaica, classified as a food, a dietary supplement, or a drug, depending on what is presented to us. And this is based on the intended use, the use that it makes. And so when we recognize earlier, we mentioned that if it makes a claim to diagnose, cure, or treat a disease, it's classified as a drug. If it is intended use, is as a food, and it is to be ingested to supplement the diet, then it be classified as a dietary supplement. What claims are allowed to be made on these products? And there are three types. It can be a health claim, a nutrient content claim, or a structure function claim. And uh, the examples are there, so when you get the presentation, you're able to see. But as it relates to your health claim, um, products can make claims such as maintains healthy circulatory systems, or diets high in calcium may reduce the risk of osteoporosis. But disease claim is not allowed, and these are samples of claims that are allowed. Now, the safety integrity is very important when we do our assessment of supplements. And we look at the toxicity, the adverse events of the product in terms of its acute, its long-term effect, and whether the effect is mild or severe. Reporting responsibility, which is associated with pharmacovigilance. We look at interactions, contraindications, um, a lot inter interaction with other dietary supplements as well as pharmaceuticals. Um, we also look at the use of these supplements in children. The safety categorization, as we said before, plays an, a major role in assessing these products as to whether it is on the continuum to a food or it is going to be classified as a drug. And of course, every dietary supplement that is an injectable preparation is classified as a drug. And I just wanted to share with us some adverse events associated with some supplements. And um, L-tryptophan and eosinophilia, myalgia syndrome, was found in 1989. And 1,500 cases came down with that condition, and we had 27 deaths. And this was all attributed to contamination in the manufacturing process in a facility in Japan. And the product was really a muscle building powder. Then we have another example here where we see digital, digital, digitalis poisoning resulting from planting derived dietary supplement contaminated by digitalis latana. And uh, as time goes on, you will see some more. But of course, we have seen where there have been contamination with all of these others. Just want to mention adverse events that we know as it relates to um, drug interaction with St. John's Worth. And I'm not going to go too much into that because we're all very familiar due to the inducing or inhibition of liver enzymes and uh, the drug interactions with products such as cyclosporine, the benzodiazepines, and so on. Just to mention mohong as one of those botanical herbs that contains ephedrine, and there are numerous side effects associated with this product. This is a list of restricted herbs, restricted not only in Jamaica, but in other jurisdictions. And um, we we'll realize that um, comfrey is listed there. And uh, we in Jamaica allow for comfrey to be used topically and not orally. Cava is listed there, for, and we recognize that the adverse events, liver damage, 
and um, we could think about yohimbi being listed there as well. And so these are all restricted herbs in Jamaica. Restricted meaning it can be made available, but only under the use of the appropriate professional. So regulatory requirements as it relates to the Ministry of Health. Um, all of this discussion started from as early as 2005. The Ministry of Health in association with the Holistic Herbal Association um, started a discussion and it got to the point where as early as 2006, 2007, some recommendations were made for the Food and Drug Act to be amended and the steps were taken to ensure that same would have been um, accomplished. However, up until now, we have not been able to have those amendments done, and so we are working on it. But just to let you know, just to let you know that currently, there are some collaborative work that is going on, and uh, the work has started again, and uh, the, in the industry will be invited to have their, um, their, their input into the discussion, and uh, the work is looking at the amendment to the Food and Drugs Act and regulations to include what we would classify as natural health products. Um, and we have in place an advisory panel mechanism for complementary medicine that was in place in 2005-2006. We, we need to reestablish that panel. And uh, currently we have our food advisory committee which is working along with the team that is working to do the amendment. So I mentioned earlier why we had separated herbal products from natural health products or health foods, and that is because of the, the various categorization that we have in terms of being contemplated to be included in the regulation. And these are some of the definitions. We have specific de definition for herbs, which includes plant materials, example leaves, flowers, seeds, fruit stems, wood bark, and so on, which may be entire fragmented or powdered, and we have a different definition for herbal materials, different definitions for herbal remedies, and we will see more of that when you get the handout. For health food, on the other hand, we have included in health food our dietary supplements, and we have also included nutraceuticals in the definition. What are the requirements now for the registration of natural health products in Jamaica? The manufacturer needs to provide us with a statement of content. And the statement of contents must speak to the concentration, the source, and dose of the, of the active ingredient. It must speak to the non-active ingredients as well. It must speak to the use of the drug, the rationale for the combinations, if there are combinations. It must speak to the side effects. It must provide information as it relates to the, the, the quality assurance test conducted. It must provide information to support the labor claims. Of course, if it is coming from another jurisdiction, approval in the country of origin is required as long as that is something that is established in that country. Otherwise, we ask for a free sale certificate. It must be on the market in that country. Scientific support for shelf life, as I mentioned before, a fee, and other pertinent information. Of course, we are experiencing challenges, and the challenges that public perception remains and will continue to, 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 to grow as it relates to whether or not these products are safe and free of adverse events. Of course, we have challenges as it relates to regulatory intervention because the regulatory approach and the scope in, in various jurisdictions are different. And so when a Ministry of Health would establish a particular guideline and require a particular submission, it may not be forthcoming from other jurisdictions. Of course, there's gap in public education. That's a challenge that we are facing. Insufficient information for many herbs, as was mentioned earlier. Inadequate laboratory support. Are we able to co conduct the test on all the products that we receive? And uh, the requisite documentation that we require for the registration is not always supplied. Many supplements contain multi ingredients and a change in compos composition over time or are used intermittently at doses difficult to measure, which is a major challenge in terms of being able to even capture post marketing information. And uh, as I mentioned earlier about the problem with us detecting the issues as it relates to adverse events, it may take a long time for the current system of volunteer adverse events to catch up. What are our expectations coming out of the regulation of our supplements? Maximum benefits to the consumer, no double standards in the industry, honest communication to the public, and public health, safe, public health and safety not compromised. I close with the same slide that I started with. The best prescription for disease prevention is healthy lifestyle.
One question. Over here, are the energy drinks coming into this? Um, will they fall under this? Okay, the energy drinks, um, as it relates to the regulation of same, um, most jurisdictions right now do not regulate energy drinks. The Ministry of Health had moved to establishing some guidelines as to how an energy drink could come to our market, which included mostly label standards and uh, a particular um, maximum concentration of certain ingredients. That's the, that's the action that we took some years ago, recognizing the issues as it relates to the safety of these products and the concerns that were being aired as it relates to persons that would have consumed these products, may, maybe having succumbed to, 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 the, to the use of these products. But moving forward, Mrs. Um, <coughs> Mrs. M Mrs. Wilson Blake, uh, as a matter of fact, I did have it in the presentation, but I, 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 didn't, get, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't present it based on the fact that what we find is, is very controversial and every other country is moving towards regulating same as a food versus as a nutritional supplement. But of course, the Ministry of Health is being proactive and looking at the safety concerns, looking at the public health risk, and will be definitely taking the necessary steps to make sure that our public is protected from any product that may be harmful. Um, excellent presentation, Mrs. Lois Graham. I have been young and now I'm old. Uh, and every time I see on these slides inadequate labs, it's a multi billion dollar industry. You can charge people millions and they will pay you because they have their money, especially with cannabis coming, they have money. It's full-time, government, agencies, step up to the plate. You cannot tell me that you're going to depend on paper submitted by individuals who want to register products. We should be able in Jamaica to verify, to somehow cross-reference whatever they are saying with what we find out. I think we are wasting time, Mrs. Lewis. We have educated people in this country who have PhD in all kinds of things and who have no jobs. This is an avenue that we can create some jobs for people. It's time we charge them. So if you send something, we are going to charge your ex because we need to pay our qualified technicians or lab personnel, sophisticated lab, they want to come, so let them pay. The, we must now find ways and means to stop making these slides a little more attractive by saying we have ISO approved whatever lab so people outside can realize we're in business. Okay, thanks for that input. I just want to share a couple of things as it relates to building laboratory capacity. Um, CARCO uh, has, has, moved, uh, has taken the initiative to improve our labs locally and um, when, I, when I think about the fact that you probably know about um, CRDTL um, now is known as the CARCO lab and what, what has happened is that the CARCO lab has moved to being um, certified and they are actually WHO certified currently and they are actually going to be widening their portfolio as it relates to the functions that they are carrying out. So we're looking forward to having them on board to help us with the assessment of these supplements. However, we have also been engaging and having discussion with the Scientific Research Council because they have indicated that they have the capacity to do those, these testings. But what obtains is that when we're looking at a regulatory capacity, we need to ensure that the lab that we're using to conduct the test is a legal lab. If we don't use a legal lab, then we have no jurisdiction in court with the information that we're using. And so we are seeking to build the capacity of the CARFA lab, which is the legal lab for which the government of Jamaica looks for the assessment of the products. So work is going on. It's just that, um, like everything else, things are moving a little bit slowly. But I take your point as it relates to the marijuana industry growing. And that is an area that we're capitalizing on to see how it is that we can build capacities in our labs as well. Mrs. Lewis Graham, regarding the immunizer products and Black Stallion, can you tell me where the <laughs> ministry actually, what role they played in having them marketed? especially with Ebenezer having the stem cell product on the market and so on? Uh, Immunizer. 
The Ministry of Health has moved to have discussion with the manufacturer of these products. Currently, currently, currently there are about three or four of those products that have been approved by us. But the discussion started, I think it was in 2014, when they were actually called in to have the discussion as it relates to regularizing the products that they are marketing and as it rela relates to the claims that they are indicating, right? What obtains is that the discussion is going ongoing because of course the evidence of proof as to the efficacy of the product lies with the manufacturer. And so under the circumstances, the immunizer discussion is going on and as it relates to whether or not we're going to be able to get the information from them to be able to allow the market, allow them to continue to market the products is something that we're going to have to take some serious decision about pretty soon. Because the information as it relates to the clinical studies being conducted or any kind of scientific information to substantiate the claim is not forthcoming. So that's something that we need to discuss with them. However, as it relates to what was the other product? The black stallion, the black stallion product on the market. Um, it was, it probably was maybe about um, two years ago that they submitted the documentation to the Ministry of Health for the registration of the product. The process is not complete. The process is not complete based on the fact that we still have not been able to get any information from the manufacturer of the raw material. And as I mentioned earlier. When we're assessing the product, we look at the source of the raw material. We have not been able to get any information from the manufacturer of the raw material, and therefore we will now definitely have to move to take action as it relates to that product as well.